Bontadi, good evening. The governor of Aruba, His Excellency, Mr. Juan Alfonso Bucaut, the Prime Minister, Her Excellency, Ms. Evelina Weber Cruz, the State Councillor at the Council of State of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Ms. Mildred Schwengle, the National Ombudsman of the Netherlands, Mr. Rainier von Zutphen, the Deputy Representative of the Netherlands in Aruba, Mr. David Abrahams. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, and all of you online connected with us. We hereby declare protocol observed. Please sit down. My name is Viola Hoytke, and I'm the rector of the University of Aruba. Welcome at the UA Climate Change Symposium 2022. The initiative for this conference came from our esteemed guest, Millie Schwengler. During my visit to the Netherlands, at her office at the Council of State in The Hague, the idea of a conference on climate change in Aruba came up. And we both immediately were very enthusiastic. To my mind came this alarming map of the Netherlands in nearly full blue, showing the situation of the Netherlands due to the rising sea level in the year 2100. A full blue map, 97% covered with water. I thought, how would the map of Aruba look like in, look like in 80 years? if we don't start to change our attitude and to start to take actions on climate change. Posing questions on sustainability and climate change should be part of our curriculum and the way we organize the university. So far at the University of Aruba, we face these challenges in our program on sustainable island solutions through science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, better known as system. In our hospitality and tourism studies, and in some more classes throughout the university, we focus on climate change issues. And our system students and PhDs focus full-time on a sustainable future and looking for sol solutions for island states. But what else can we do in higher education? There are sustainability challenges at all levels. This Friday, we organized a conference on environmental, social, and governance factors and sustainable engineering. And I'm very happy that Minister Weber will join us and give his opening address and also welcome today here. So we can look all around us and we realize yeah, everywhere we need to do something. In our building, you hear the air conditioning working. Can we do it more efficient or use it in a different way? What about our cars? We already took a step and now lease one electric car since last summer. We are looking when we renovate our roof, is it possible to put solar panels on it? These are small steps, but also these must be taken and discussed. I think it is important that all students are confronted with sustainability questions. It is, especially in Europe, a clear trend to include courses on climate change in university curricula. Let me give me an example. Sustainability will be a compulsory subject at Radboud University in Nijmegen for all students from the academic year 2022-2023. There are no such plans at our university here in Aruba, but maybe an approach adapted to the specific needs of every discipline and the island setting is more demanding, but also more useful to the students' future careers. We train our students to find creative solutions. 
and makes them aware of their duty for the next generation. As a lawyer with a strong background in consumer law, I'm regularly confronted with legal systems that contain strange contradictions when it comes to legal solutions on the one hand and to sustainability goals on the other hand. I would like to illustrate this with an example from Aruba. Let us imagine the case of a mobile phone bought at a well-known dealer, price 800 florin, happy buyer, taking a lot of photos, and out of the blue, one month later, this phone breaks down, is not working anymore. In the Aruban Civil Code, the way in which the consumer can obtain his right when he has bought a non-conforming item is regulated in Book 7 of the Civil Code, and we speak there of the remedies a buyer has. So this buyer with his broken phone, he could ask for repair and replacement. But in the end, it's the seller's choice what he's offering. His options are repair, replacement, or paying back the purchase price. To help to avoid waste, to stimulate producers to make products better and repairable, it would help to change the laws towards a clear preference for repairing goods. We can write general policies on this topic, but at the same time, we have to study each single paragraph, for example, in the civil code, on a micro level, where we could already make a change. Repair needs to be put higher in the hierarchy of remedies. Exchange means very often waste. Repair is generally the most sustainable. And what happens to goods which are replaced? Most times they are destroyed. But mentioned before, even here, there would be other options. Very few countries in the last year elaborated clear rules on refurbished goods. Rules on refurbished goods could also be a step towards a circular economy. Today, many more speakers will share their thoughts with us. These reflections from a lawyer's perspective are only one perspective on the topic of our conference today. I'm sure that in our daily life, we all could make a difference and a step forward with regard to the ongoing climate change. Each of our faculty is contributing by their research, for example, on more sustainable tourism or on green finance, a topic where we host a conference on Friday. As rector of the university, I welcome the opportunity to exchange our for sure quite diverse views on climate change today. I assure you that climate change will stay on the agenda of the university. And I would like to thank Millie Schwengle to encourage us to organize this conference. A special thanks also to Jan Robert Moons for yeah, his enormous help in designing the program of today. And to all of you for following our invitation and a special thanks to all the many people I see here on the yeah, internet in the online connection. Thank you for joining us through these means. And a special thanks to our sponsor, FNO, the Vertegenwoordiging von Nederland in Oranjestadt. Thank you very much for your support in making this conference happen. Now I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Mr. Robert Jan Moons. Mr. Moons, please come forward. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hoefter. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge also the, uh, the presence of the uh, Vice President of the Department of Aruba, Mr. Raymond Kappelby, uh, and in the attention, um, our Minister of Economic Affairs, Communications, and Sustainable Development, Mr. Geoffrey Weber. With that, we have a new protocol observed, and it means that our distinguished speakers will not be missing the honorable guests in this evening. Thank you. Furthermore, some domestic remarks. Uh, please put your cell phones on silent, obviously. And we are observing the COVID 19 protocol, so please keep your mouth mask on while not speaking. Um, 
for being on the stage. So then, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start the proceedings of the program actually. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder, for the opening address and the consideration of the university on sustainability. Thank you very much. Next up will be the keynote speaker of the evening, uh, the Prime Minister of Aruba, Her Excellency Mrs. Evelina Major Cruz. Mrs. Cruz is currently serving as Minister of General Affairs, Innovation, Welcome Organization, Infrastructure, and Spatial Planning. Prime Minister will be speaking of climate change responses for Aruba and Aruba's national energy policy for 2030 and 2050. Prime Minister, please come forward. All observed, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I cannot see all of you, but I'm here. First of all, on behalf of the government of Aruba, I would like to thank the University of Aruba for hosting this symposium on the important topic of climate change. It is an honor to participate in this event and to share some perspective from the side of the government. Let me also give you a brief overview of the climate responses that the government is putting forward. First, a general perspective. Global challenges are intensifying. Our climate is changing rapidly and dramatically. In the Caribbean region, we are witnessing record-breaking hurricane seasons with temperatures rising towards extreme heat levels. The forecasts show a hike in energy consumption. Seawater level rise is a threat to the beaches that have a pivotal economic function in our islands. The reality is that we are also still within the global crisis induced by COVID-19. As we confront the pandemic and as we embark on our pathway to economic recovery, we must conclude that it has not slowed down climate change. The consequences of these overlapping risks can be devastating to the most vulnerable countries and territories in the world being small island development states. And now more than ever, small island nations need to adapt and increase their ability to absorb environmental and economic shocks. There is simply no time to waste. As for Aruba, our first response to climate change is simply to reduce our own carbon footprint. Although our emissions are low on a global scale, our belief is that all change starts from within. If we want for big countries to take real climate action, then small islands have to do what they can in their own domain. And this is also why at various UN climate conferences, many small island development states were among those who made the biggest pledges, despite the fact that they have contributed the least themselves to these problems. The government of Aruba, together with key stakeholders, have been preparing a new national energy policy for this purpose. The energy policy has been completed, although I need to convey that a publication has been delayed due to other short-term priorities. However, we still intend to go forward with the publication soon. The new national energy policy of Aruba is meeting the criteria set forth in the EU National Energy and Climate Plans, the NECP. These plans, the plans that the EU, EU members, uh, that the EU member states must submit to the European Commission to demonstrate how they will fulfill the EU Paris Agreement commitments. It addresses the dimensions of the EU energy policy directives. We will be the first OCT with a true NECP, we will receive EU subsidies to implement it. Our energy goals will be the following. First, to reduce CO2 emissions by at least 45% from 2010 to 2030 in accordance with the UN's goal 
of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to be carbon neutral by 2050 in accordance to the Paris Agreement. Second, to increase energy efficiency of businesses, households, and other organizations by at least 15% from 2020 to 2030. Third, to increase the share of renewable energy for electricity production to 35% per 2024 and at least 50% by 2030. And fourth, to increase adoption of electric vehicles, personal cars, to at least 15% by 2030. Just some remarks. Further to these energy goals, we do not want to compromise the reliability and the affordability of the energy supply. Also, we are observing the macroeconomic impact of the energy sector. We have come to the resolution that this impact is critical and it includes effects such as inflation, balance of payment and labor market. Within these goals, we are on track to meet both the Paris Agreement and the UN goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. You need to consider this as a base plan. It is realistic and it has the support of key stakeholders in Aruba. However, it does not mean that we will not explore more ambitious plans as to further accelerate our energy transition. In this respect, the utility companies are studying more rapid decarbonization pathways in order to increase renewable energy. The utility companies are also planning to use liquefied natural gas, LNG, as a transition fuel due to the fact that Aruba's second 50% of renewable energy may require innovative technologies that are not yet proven at this moment. And Aruba will focus on hydrogen as one of the most promising, clean and innovative technologies to accelerate the energy transition. With this, ladies and gentlemen, a lot will be going on to accelerate our energy transition. Yet, this has to be completed by modernization of our energy legislation and regulatory framework. Final note on the refinery, since this is often asked. Let me be clear. We are including clean refining considerations in the negotiations geared at a potential Aruba refinery opening. Clean in the sense that it is powered by gas instead of oils. Clean refining naturally has a huge economic impact, which we strongly need for our economic resilience at this point. The other angle to our climate response is to prepare for the climate change that seems unavoidable. In short, climate change adaptation or simply adaptation. For Aruba, this means strengthening our climate resilience. It is foreseen that climate change adaptation will require large infrastructural investment. And to deal with this area, we are instituting a new climate change council that will devise a new set of recommendations in this area. And likely we will be seeking input from key stakeholders for this plan. With this, I'm coming to the closing of this address. As you have heard, our energy policy is undergoing a fundamental reform and our energy system will be subject to innovation to contribute to our goals. Our ultimate goal remains to be carbon neutral and self-reliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Aruba is committed to the movement against climate change. Like I said, our belief is that all change starts within, but only if all islands and all nations stand together. It is then that we can win this battle on climate change. 
Thank you once, for, once more for inviting me to this symposium, and I'm looking forward to listening to the various other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for these enlightening uh, words, and we look forward to the presentation of the plan. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, so, let me briefly outline the structure of the program for tonight. So, you will see in the program that's on your seats that we have uh, two blocks of speakers. The first block is geared at policy and the institutional framework relating to climate change. And the second block is geared at climate risks and responses. So the second block will be more pragmatic. And of course, we uh, look forward to listening to the, um, the highly interesting speakers. And then at the end, we'll have a short panel discussion, time permitting, to wrap it all together. So just a domestic remark, um, since we have um, a list, a full program for this evening. We uh, cannot unfortunately take questions after each talk. However, you can send your question if you have one via email to the email address of the Center for Lifelong Learning, which was the invitation email that you received for this event. So you could reply to that email in order to submit a question. And I will just read it. It's CLL, very simple, from Center of Lifelong Learning at UA.edu. A w. And the persons on Zoom could also submit questions in the chat box, and we will, time permitting, also take a question from the Zoom list. So, without further ado, we're up to our next speaker. I like walking around, so sorry for moving away from this desk. But um, we will welcome Mrs. Mildred Schwengel. Mrs. Schwengel is a former attorney who left private practice and serves as a member of the advisory division of the Council of State of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Raad van State, as we say in Dutch. The advisory division advises the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and Dutch Parliament on legislation and governance. The Council of State operates independently from government. Her current professional focus is kingdom affairs, including foreign affairs, defense, good governance, and the rule of law and matters pertaining to the relationship between the countries of the kingdom. Let us now really welcome Mrs. Millie Schwenger, Miller Schwenger. Please come forward. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Robert John, for taking the time to introduce me. And the uh, protocol has been served. Good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It's an honor to be here and, and humbling to share the stage with a group of uh, highly knowledgeable people. Um, so in August last year, the UN IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, issued a report titled The Physical Basis. Um, the report delivers a dire but predictable message. Uh, it says, today evidence is overwhelming that the debate has indeed, that the climate has indeed changed since the pre-industrial era and that human activities are the principal cause of that change. Human caused global warming, is considered by many one of the most pressing issues facing the world today. And for good reason, the consequences of global warming are devastating and often irrevocable. They include rising sea levels, reduced biodiversity, an increasing lack of food and water, including potable water, ever-growing prospects of violent conflict, and often hardly manageable streams of refugees. On a more local level, 
in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the message has been echoed by the Kingdom's Supreme Court. In a shattering opinion known as the Urgenda ruling, uh, the Supreme Court notes that it uses the term dangerous climate change. Um, and it does say that um, global warming may lead to climate revolutions. Um, and it speaks about the so-called tipping points. The Supreme Court concludes that this dangerous climate change is threatening to lives, the well-being and the living environments of a large number of people, both around the world and in the Netherlands. It was a Dutch case. The debate on climate change is not new. Official reports with warnings about the far-reaching consequences of climate change go back as far as the 70s and the 80s. Examples are the, limit, the limits to growth published by the so-called Club of Rome that was in 1972 and our common future released by the Brundtland Commission in 87. And it is the Brundtland Commission which came up with a legal concept of sustainable development. Climate change affects people all over the world. It's a global problem, as the Prime Minister just mentioned, that needs to be addressed globally. A pioneering role in addressing climate change has been played by international law, which has seen the creation of an ever-growing body of cross-border climate regulations, soft laws, and specific principles. States and organizations have adopted regulations in the form of resolutions, statements, and code of conduct. Other climate regulations have been codified in a series of international treaties. The Paris Agreements, for instance, that the Prime Minister just mentioned, that was adopted in 2015. It was signed, um, that's my understanding, um, last time I checked, by no fewer than uh, 196 countries. And that for the first time committed to a clearly defined uh, to clearly define goals and specific measures in the field of climate and sustainable development. But I must emphasize also the important role of our courts, the jurisprudence worldwide. The international community has further recognized the special position of small island development states. Um, as we know, during the, the Earth Summit, a long time ago, 92, um, these so-called SITs were acknowledged as a separate group sharing certain characteristics. And even though every small island is obviously different from all others, the international community recognized that they do have in common certain vulnerabilities, especially in the face of climate change. This vulnerable position of small islands is of particular relevance to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, whose territories include no fewer than three such cities, Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin. And I, although Bonaire and Seba and Stacia are so close to my heart, um, they will not, for obvious re reasons, be included in the presentation today. As it's um, Aruba, but also Curacao and St. Martin, um, is especially vulnerable to climate change. A large part of the tourism infrastructure lies just above the sea level. This vulnerability is ironic. If you consider the island's footprints, which are negligible compared with those of larger countries. 
A report published by the UN IPCC in 2007 found that small islands emit less than 1% of global greenhouse gases. And yet small islands are first in line to be hit by the consequences of climate change. The damage which they bound to suffer as a result of global warming is wildly disproportionate to their footprints. So how do we proceed? And it is inspiring when you speak with people in Aruba and you listen to what is being done. Um, and, and, and it's inspiring to see that this energy policy is going to be introduced. There is so much going on and there's so much being done. Um, there is in-depth expertise in Aruba. Um, I only know that Mr. Bimans is sitting here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's extensive. But as countries within, the dots need to be con connected. So Aruba and the small islands um, should consider to make a thorough assessment of their current position in the face of climate change, but also in the change of climate transition, because uh, we are we are all together in that boat. Things are accelerating, uh, changing. So assessment of the current position in the face of climate change and transition, look at to make an evaluation of the effect, effects which climate change and transition may have on their economies and the livelihood both now and in the future. Um, you can think short term, you can look at the middle term and the long term. I think that is something that we need to do. You can raise the question, how will climate change and transition affect tourism, for example, the island's principal source of income? How will the airlift be affected? What policies and adaptations should be implemented to mitigate consequences in order to safeguard the position of the islands, the energy policy, for instance? What policy, policies or programs entailing the enhancement of awareness of our behavior it, as humans is needed? How will the rise of sea level affect our shorelines? What adaptations do our ports need? And how will climate change and transition affect an open economy that is highly dependent on import of basic items and on shipping connections to make those imports possible? How climate neutral are our investors and how will they respond to climate change? These are only a few questions to be addressed in a broad evaluation providing, I would say, a helicopter view of the issues. And maybe, Prime Minister, the board that, that you are uh, preparing, this is something that they could uh, take on. Next, the islands need to prepare a plan of action for dealing with the projected consequences of climate change and transition as it affects everything from agriculture and tourism to a country's health care system and the price of a cup of coffee. This is why a plan of action needs to involve all sectors of a society. Only a cross-sectoral approach, sector overstating in, in Dutch, will be successful in managing the overall effects of climate change and transition and will cushion the consequences. It is also important for a plan of action to take a long-term approach, it should be prepared by people who understand our particulars and have a vision that stretches well into the future. We know that investors focus most of the time on short-term, while we also know that the focus and the strength of our administrations 
is not first and foremost on long-term planning. But climate change and transition will not be likely to disappear anytime soon. Also, they will evolve as time elapses. Therefore, a successful plan of action should not only be a long-term endeavor, it should also provide flexibility to cope with changes. You could even, a climate board is a very, um, wonderful idea um, but as the council of state we even recommended to the the dutch government to um appoint a, a minister that will have that in his portfolio in his in, in dedicated minister on climate so that is also something that could be considered of course climate change and transition is such an intricate itch issue that it would be hard for any island state to tackle it by itself. The recommended course of action is to turn climate resilience into a collaborative effort. Aruba, but also Curacao and St. Martin should look for possibilities to further collaborate on climate issues with other countries, internationally and especially within the kingdom. Before my closing remarks, please allow me to also mention the relationship with the European Union. Um, as of 64, which was a very good year, um, our islands are OCTs. Um, and where OCTs were not considered to be a third party in the sense of European law, uh, Unirecht. Um, we are no full members of the European Union either. Um, there is a, a specific part of European law that is applicable to, to OCTs, but through jurisprudence, jurisprudence of the European Court of uh, Justice, you could say grosso modo that general principles of European Union also apply to the OCTs. Um, I, would see, I would say collaboration should further be sought within the framework of the OCT EU. Um, we could also see if there's any climate related funding uh, available for OCTs. What you see now is that, uh, that is my understanding, that OCTs get technical uh, assistance, but I think we would, we would need more. And with respect to the kingdom, um, I would say we shouldn't forget our fundamentals, our core values. The Charter of the Kingdom of the Netherlands mentions that fundamental rights are to be safeguarded within the kingdom. Respect for human rights is one of our fundamentals. Each of the kingdom countries is required to make sure that the human rights of its people are protected. And then, of course, there is a guarantor position of the kingdom government itself. As the Kingdom Supreme Court noted in the Urgenda ruling, climate change directly affects the lives of people and the right to life is one of the most fundamental principles protected under the European Convention of Human Rights. Climate change can touch the core values that have been trusted to the respective governments of the countries of the kingdom. These core values should encourage us to reach out to each other and stand united in these unprecedentedly challenging times. And I would like to um, refer to a speech of our King before the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2019, and I know you were there, um, Prime Minister, uh, who, appointed that, who pointed out that only um, working together um, we can only combat climate change if we work together um, and share our knowledge. Um, this was an address in an international context, but 
The same could apply to cooperation within the kingdom. The Netherlands has been a great supporter of um, developing countries and cities. Um, within the kingdom, we need to also connect the dots, I would say, and jointly assess where our islands could tag along. Coping with climate change requires new investments, uh, the adaptation side, um, the technical side, and that requires fresh funding. Um, our kingdom islands need this, um, this climate funding. At the other hand, um, we must also make sure that we do meet the specific criteria to be able to de facto qualify to get the funds. So I think we can applaud the energy um, uh, policy that is being implement, implemented in order for Aruba to qualify de facto to get the funds. When it has to do with climate change and climate transition within the kingdom, I would say we shouldn't hesitate to ask for assistance to this respect. And I would say the Netherlands would also take on the noble task to assist and empower. The urgency of climate change calls for the kingdom to stand united. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, um, Mrs. Schreiner, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, also, Keys, who indeed, due to their constituent position, do not have access to the climate finance streams, such as developing countries under the uh, UN climate framework. That, of course, is something to be discussed at the level of the um, OCC Countries Association in Brussels, but definitely relevant to us. So now we would welcome the um, National Ombudsman of the Netherlands, Mr. Reinier van Zutten. Mr. van Zutten is a graduate in law from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and he has been a judge at the Joint Court of Appeal for the Netherlands Antilles and Aruba, quite close to us. He was sworn in as a national ombudsman of the Netherlands in 2015. Mm -hmm. The ombudsman safeguards the rights of citizens in the Netherlands. We are honored to have him. Let us welcome Mr. Ponzitti. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here as the national ombudsman of the Netherlands speaking in Aruba. But your Prime Minister this morning promised that next time you will have the Aruban Ombudsman speaking on things that really concern Aruba. Yes, so. and, and we're working on it. But, but she underlined that it is not up to the government, it's up to the Parliament. So we will kindly ask the Parliament to make it happen that next year on this spot, we will have the Ombudsman of Aruba explaining what's going on when energy transition and the impact on citizens is at stake. But for the moment, I feel a sort of honored replacement for the next coming Aruban Ombudsman. And I think there's something I can tell you, but from the national perspective of, of the perspective of the National Ombudsman of the Netherlands. And I will combine that with some of the work of my colleague in St. Martin. Uh, and I, I think I have some, 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 some 10 minutes to do that. And the most important thing I would like you to remember after this conference from what I have said is that it is important not only to talk about systems, climates, but to talk about the citizens and the trust they must have into their governments when something is at stake as their daily life. I was, I think, with colleagues, it was in 2017 on St. Martin, and it was the, the governor's conference on climate change. And I saw the map drawn of St. Martin, what will happen when the sea level rises? What then will be left of St. Martin? And we saw what the effects will be 
when temperature is rising, what we'll do with drought and with water and sometimes over flooding and sometimes, well, you know all the stories. And what came out of that is that people trust you, governments, that you will take the measures necessary to make them, I would say, survive. Can be in very different ways. It can be in building sustainable. It can be in other forms and sources of energy using. It can be in whatever, but it is important that you, we, ask our governments to be in touch, in direct touch with the people living on the islands, living in the Netherlands, and ask them what is needed for you as a Ruben or a Dutchman or a Curaçao uh, um, uh, ombudsman probably, but certainly inhabitant. What's needed? What shall we do? What, what measures shall we take? And what will the government take for their part? And what is expected from the people living on the islands? What do they themselves have to take for their parts? And I can assure you that it is not a difficult, not an easy, but a difficult task we have there. Let me explain you a bit on the example, a sort of intermediate case of what is happening in Groningen. You probably know Groningen, northern part of the country of the Netherlands, uh, the northern part, I would say, of the kingdom. And we, we, we found gas there many, many, many years ago. And we used it for our energy. So we could have a transition also in energy from coal to gas, from wood to gas, which was seen as very important. It was also more clean. It helped the environment. But now after all these years, we see what the effects of that is. Mm. 70, years, 70 years on, we see that the extraction of gas is causing lots of problems for people living in that part of the country. We have earthquakes, which is uncommon to the Netherlands, given the situation there and the, the climate and the, uh, the, 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 the centered part of that country in the northern part of Europe and the globe is not normal to have such a tremendous number, I would say, of earthquakes, but it is. And people trust our government there in the Netherlands that they will take measures, that they will solve the problems. And to be honest, that is a rather hard task. And our governments are not doing that well. We see people left behind and we see people in, in, in distress and we see people in huge problems and we see small kids with our perspectives. So what we can learn from that, I will not elaborate on that case too long, but what we can learn from that is that if something, something really, I would say, um, of, of great importance brings a big change in the lives of many, we have to be prepared to take care of that as governments. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they can sit and lean back and do nothing themselves? No, that's not. But we should be in contact with them. We should ask, how can we prepare for such a situation? What can we do here in Aruba, now that we know that climate is changing? How can we together build our houses better? How can we arrange for sanitation? Sustainable development goals will be topic in this, in this seminar within a few minutes. So how can we achieve that? Sanitation, health, and most of all, first of all, I would say, how to prevent poverty to become, become even worse than it is already. In all the four countries of our kingdom, but specifically here in this part of the kingdom. So climate change is not something in itself. Energy transition is not something in itself. It is something that causes new challenges, but also new problems. And if we don't take care of our people, then it will be for some of them disastrous. And we already know that we have a split in society. We have those who can, and we have those who cannot that easy. And we must prevent those who cannot to become the group, that group, to prevent that that, that group is growing, uh, and we, on the contrary, should take care of them so that they can be part of society. The social cohesion will, will sustain, will be there, will grow, that we can do it together, that we have the opportunities and the money, as was explained already, and the rules and the laws and the systems 
particularly the commitment of our governments to our citizens that we will do what is needed and necessary to overcome these effects of which we are for sure knowing they will come. It is not a matter of getting it down and cooling down the earth. No, it is a matter of how to reduce it, the warming up to 1.5, which will be an enormous task. And it's, it is that we already know that the, the, the sea levels will be raising. So what then to do? And we know that now the hurricane season is well, probably the, the band is broadening. Would it, would it also touch Aruba and Curacao or Bonaire? How would, it, how would it be in the near future? Shall we, must we be prepared? In Groningen, for example, to make the, the comparison, we knew that there were earthquakes and we still built houses and schools and hospitals that were not earthquake proof. Although we knew we should actually do that for whatever reason, financial or other, we did not do that. Let's not make that mistake now here. So if we know for sure what's going to happen, we must be prepared. Another example is, of course, uh, Hurricane Irma, who was in 2017 over the islands of St. Martin and Saba and Stacia. And what we see still now there on, on St. Martin is that the effects of that four year old in, in, in this already four year ago that this, this, this Irma came over the island, the, the effects are still visible. Repairs have not taken place full. We still, still, still see people who are not living in their old houses. We see how we see elderly people still in shelters after so many years. And we still have to look, I would say, in the mirror. How come that we were not prepared? And how come that we did not take the measures necessary to give these poor people a chance to live and pick up their lives? Something is going on, and I will not blame anybody, probably later on, but not today. I will not blame anybody, but I will warn myself, my staff, my colleagues, that we must be prepared. Next time, we should do better. And I advise you to go through the report my colleague Glenn Mosso wrote on the situation on, on St. Martin and the, the, the 10 minute, 12 minute movie she made, a, a documentary. And there you will see what the effects of climate change, hurricanes, and I would say insufficient action of governments causes for problems for the people. I'm an ombudsman, so I hope you forgive me to be a bit, you know, critical to what has happened. But I think it is a good way to frame and to make you realize how important it is that we all together, the people of the countries, their governments, the ombudsman, of course, the from Aruba for sure, shall work together. We must be prepared. It is essential. And I think but the citizen's perspective, which is something the Ombudsman always underlines wherever he speaks, citizens' perspectives should be number one on the list. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Zuppen, uh, the Ombudsman. And it's really um, nice to hear how uh, the work of the Ombudsman also relates to these kind of circumstances that can occur in these islands or even in citizens in the Netherlands. So our next speaker will be um, Dr. Ryan Peterson, the General Manager Economic Policy at the Central Bank of Aruba. Dr. Peterson is well known. He's an Aruba native with a proven scientific and policy development track record across academia and the public sector. Dr. Peterson has conducted extensive scientific research as well as policy studies on innovation, resilience, sustainability, all in small island development states. Dr. Peterson, please come forward. Thank you very much, Robert John. Good afternoon observing protocol. It's a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to share some thoughts on climate change and economic resilience in small island state economies. 
and I will take a macroeconomic perspective. And with the permission of the Prime Minister, I will piggyback off your presentation because I think you made some very strong points earlier. So for our international guests, once upon a time, there was a small, lazy, happy-go-lucky island in the Caribbean. Uh, these are pictures taken in 1954, 55, 56. And this was what Aruba looked like. 40,000 people, no more than that, maybe 39,000. Our GDP per capita was $1,400. Right now, it's approximately $23,000, $24,000. Just to give you a perspective, Yet, it was an early morning in October 54. Remember where you were in 1954? No idea. <laughs> and the rain started to fall and showers came in and it simply did not stop. That was Hurricane Hazel, 1984. This was the bridge at Parkitanbos, 1954. It was damaged. The total amount of damages in economic terms back then was only 700,000 florins. Approximately 30% of the GDP was wiped out in 24 hours. It took three months of COVID to wipe out 30%. This just happened in 24 hours. And as Mr. Zutphen pointed out, even years after that, they still felt the effect. But what is past is prolonged, as Shakespeare would say. And how eloquent this is for a picture, because this photo is taken in the tents. But for those natives on the island, as myself, Pakita Bus has a history of being somewhat tempered by climate and other types of disasters. The rest, as they say, what history? Mr. Zitfan already pointed out, asked the question, is the bandwidth of the hurricane opening up? Yes, it is. Is Aruba outside of the hurricane belt? No. Is it on the peripheral? Yes. That little red dot there is Aruba. And you see the little triangle in the middle there? I won't get into the geological explanations for that or even the religious reasons for that. Maybe yes. some of you might say, people don't give you know, with the power of God, we will save us. I respect all opinions. All right. But what is interesting, and I'm going to go to 1954 to 2004. So we're going to fast forward a bit. Remember what happened in September 2004? Uh, Ivan, it was the 1st of September 2004. I will never forget it. Why? Because I came back after 20 years on the 1st of September. I arrived at the airport and I'm like, How do I get to my apartment? Everything was flooded, everything, was flooded. right? So, this is 50 60 years later. Now, therein lies part of the problem we have. Happened or or this will not happen for 60 years. So we tend to look across the horizon what Mark Carney, ex-governor of the Central Bank of England called the tragedy of the horizon. Our short-sightedness ignores what's on the horizon or the warnings that we received before about things that can happen. As Millie already pointed out, our islands suffer from several vulnerabilities. And I won't go down the whole list as you well explained. We're open economies, we're tourism dependent, we're import dependent, we have limited fiscal space, yet we have very valuable, fragile ecological environments. Biodiversity is extremely important to our economy. Our critical coastal infrastructures, think about where our major economic infrastructure zones are on the island. Let's visualize that for a moment. The airport, utilities, Hospital, tourism, government. Central bank. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll get back to the central bank later. So we, we know these. So we, we are exposed. We are vulnerable. Um, and that vulnerability is not unknown in the Caribbean. The Caribbean small island states are at the front line of climate change. Over 50 billion dollars in damages annually, 5.6, 5.7% 5 loss to GDP, Aruba slightly less. But we're not immune to climate change. Climate change does not discriminate between big countries and small countries. I gotta get closer to the mic. Can I sing a song? 
It's for Zoom. Sea level rise, there was already discussed. When we look at some local numbers on sea level rise in Aruba, on average over the past 60 to 70 years, we've seen sea level rise for at least 0.4 meters. That will likely continue. We see the sea temperature rise, 1.3%. Will that continue? Very likely. The loss of biodiversity and mangrove ecosystem decay, 21%. Residential flood risks has been measured by the Central Bureau of Statistics, anywhere between 50 and 75%. And just like it's mind boggling that the Groningers would build their house in a hurricane or in a, um, what do you call that? Um, earthquake zone. Arubans have something similar. We look for the, the, the non driest zone, which is what we call in Pacimento Oroi and Bake. And we say, well, let's build a house right beside it. <laughs> and then when it rains and the front yard floods, they say, oh my God, how did this happen? Nobody warned me. So these are things that are common to human beings, humanity, we share them all, whether it's in Groningen, whether it's in Florida, whether it's in Aruba, it just happens across the world. It's very important. Now, while we may not have hurricane seasons because we're on the peripheral belt, the chances, which are less than 1%, of a huge Cat 5 hitting Aruba would wipe out 49% of GDP. That is almost twice the amount of what happened to COVID. Let's think about COVID extended for six months. Think about the infrastructure damage. And then you have an idea of how impactful climate change can be for Aruba. But climate change is not new. Our statistics, and forgive me, I'm an economist, so I have to put a graph up here. This is not, you know. But climate change has been going on for decades on the island, since the 1960s and 70s. And it is predicted to continue to rise well over that 1.5% or 1.5 Celsius, sorry, that we're looking for, if things don't change, if things don't change. Does this have an impact on our economy? Certainly. Interestingly enough, but unsurprisingly, it impacts labor productivity as measured by the GDP per capita. There is a relationship there. We know this takes in other studies, but it also applies to Ruba. As temperatures rise, our economic productivity declines, even after controlling for population growth. <clears throat> Should be an eye opener. Energy consumption, energy production, intimately tied with, with climate change and temperature rising. Air conditions are going on, as Madam Rector pointed out, and as we will see also with the national energy policies. What is interesting, though, is that this is just part of the picture. We have seen these extreme weather events and risks. And while hurricanes might have happened a century ago, every 100 years, we see over time the frequency of these hurricanes getting smaller. 100 years, 80 years, 60 years, 40 years, 20 years, 10 years. Beyond that, we also see the volatility between high rain precipitation and droughts. What is interesting are the light blue balls inside here, back into the mic, into the camera. The light blue balls indicate the frequency is happening more often. And that is not only because of climate change frequency and precipitation, but also because of the fact that most of our residential infrastructures and also commercial infrastructures are more crowded and are more likely to be exactly in those zones that the ancient Arubans would say, Bosa, don't build your house here because when it rains, it's going to flood. That knowledge, that local indigenous knowledge, it is so important, that citizen knowledge, that is essential. But we have lost that in translation. Madam Director asked, what would happen if the sea level would rise? Now, this is a simulation of sea level rise, one meter, conservative estimate of what had happened to the zone. And everything that is in blue and purple will probably be underwater. And everything that is yellow and green will probably be highly elevated. Oh, this will have an impact if that 0.4 meter rise goes up to 0 0.6, 0 0.9. San Juan, Puerto Rico is predicted to have a 1.3 meter. Now it's a fallacy to think, oh, well, that only happens in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Because we share something in common, that's the ocean and that's sea level. So when that thing goes up there, it's gonna happen here. So the logic, it's not gonna happen here or there because it happens there is kind of foolish to say the least. Of course, 
You want me to speak about finance and macroeconomics as Madam Rector pointed out. So let me just point out some of the financial risks that we have with this. And this is based on the book by the green swan. We know the black swan, but these are green swans. The interesting about things about green swans, I'm sorry, Mr. Van Zutman, I have to steal your words again, is that if we fail to respond to a green swan, a hurricane, Irma, if only because we didn't see it coming, but because we didn't take any action. So we know these things. We know these things. Are we willing to take action on these matters? And these transition risks that Millie pointed out, um, that the prime minister pointed out, but also the physical risks, they have an impact on businesses, they have an impact on households and on citizens, and they have an impact on our macroeconomy, which translate into different types of financial risks that we have, both from a government side, a public side, a sector side, and a civic center side. The Prime Minister eloquently summarized our energy transition, so I won't spend too much time. Let me just point out two things here. Our energy transition has been a long and winding process, starting way back in 1986, opening oil refinery, closing oil refinery. And throughout the different time zones and decades, we have shifted towards renewable energy through different episodes. That's so it's not something new. We've been at this and we need to improve it. Number two, the decisions we make the coming two years with regard to energy and renewable energy are determining for the coming 30 years of this island. When in the 1990s, we made decisions for the industry to focus on tourism, it shaped the culture, society, economy of our island for the coming 30 years. That's how impactful these decisions are and how important these decisions are when moving forward. But beyond climate change, beyond sea level rise, and as a grandson of a local fisherman, who is actually a person from St. Martin from Simpson Bay, right, there's one topic that has been always close to heart, and that is biodiversity. As a young boy growing up with my grandfather, going fishing at the fisherman hut, and returning in 2004 only to find half the coral gone or bleached, it makes you think. The risks we have with climate change are just not only focused on, my presentation is stuck. So what we're looking here at are ecological services and, and, bio, and uh, biological biodiversity uh, value. Um, and this is the same type of model, but it looks not only from a climate change perspective, but really focuses explicitly on the value of our biodiversity. And studies have indicated, for instance, in Holland, in the Netherlands, which is leading actually in looking at the association and transmission from biodiversity risks to financial risks, almost 34% of their GDP would be lost if biodiversity would be lost. On Aruba, we're talking approximately 17%. That is 900 million uh, that could be lost because of biodiversity damage degrading, impacting not only tourism, but our citizens, lives and livelihoods. And these are numbers that are important. It's a shame though that we need to put a number of value on nature to appreciate it, but I will return to that later on also. So when we reframe the macroeconomy, we need to be aware of a couple of things. The macroeconomy is not only about output or GDP. As much as we use them, it is an instrument, but an economy is a living organism, and it's also about economic well-being and the citizens that are involved there. And it's also about how do we sustain that economic well-being. And in that process, very often, we define sustainability as what? As meeting the needs of today without having compromises for the future. But what if, what if we just turn it around and we said, no, let's start with the future in mind. Let's start with making decisions for the future, meeting their needs, fulfilling their needs, and taking responsible actions now. And in this economic trinity, there are always three actors, institutes, if you like, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and the productive real sector. Now, recently, the blue economy, looking at biodiversity, has been included as part of that real economic sector. Traditionally, they were not viewed as being productive. Currently, approximately 10% of our GDP is produced by services offered by our ecology. Without that, 
the rest is a domino effect that just falls down right away. Now within this framework, I'm gonna skip and go straight to the conclusions uh, because of time. Um, but I would like to say though that I have some concluding thoughts. Um, obviously climate change has an effect, perfect, thank you. Climate change has an effect not only on economic growth, economic development, and the well-being, not only today, but definitely the future. And we need to be aware of that. Or short-sightedness is one of the primary problems we have with this. Secondly, while I know we tend to focus a lot on hurricanes and shocks because they catch our attention, understandably so, there is something called the chronic slow burn process that takes years, 30, 40 years. And we need to incalculate these in our policy development when we look at society, the economy, and our environment. And it is a shared responsibility between public sector, private sector, and civic society. And that is exactly where the future ombudsman will be a key role in closing that little triangle there. So thank you very much for bringing that forward. I have a, many questions, but let me leave you with this final thought that I, I share with Millie, and thank you again for organizing and hosting this conference together with the University of Aruba, values and value. Ladies and gentlemen, what is at risk here? It is not just monetary value. They're values, as you put it. Values of respect, values of responsibility that are essential, particularly in small island states, because trust is so important. Without that, institutions do not exist. And when we look at the future, these are things that we need to consider and discuss more explicitly in that future climate council that we have. I leave some questions here and I thank you very much for your attention and apologies for the technical glitches. Thank you, um, thank you so much, Dr. Peterson, for this extremely rich presentation and bringing so many cross linkages within your story. I hope that we can get back on some of those during the panel discussion later on. So now I would like to um, move over to the next speaker, who will be Mr. Fiesberg Buchhout. Mr. Buchhout, also very well known in all us, is the director of the Directorate of Nature and Environment, Directie and Natuur en Milieu, JNM. Mr. Buchhout has a long standing track record on working on Aruba's environmental policy and environmental legislation. He's also one of the advocates on ratification of international treaties. Mr. Buchhout, please come forward. While we set up your Okay. Let me take one uh, right now. <laughs> Respecting the uh, group of folks. Most of us men do wear uh, a jacket, a wooden jacket, in a room. Which will stay. The protocol is observed. Let's continue. The heat is on. And we do have quite some international treaties. Climate actions by citizen media corporations have their own points of initiation and bottom lines. Climate actions by governments are organized by treaties 
legislation, national legislation, and contracts. And they are initiated by politicians in office. I took already one climate action and I will take another one. Usually we wear jackets to state a formal event in Aruba. It is a man's wear to protect one against cold weather and consequently increases our demand to lower the indoor temperature which on its turn increases the electricity demand and increases our carbon footprint. My second climate action is this speech, advocating for a community effort implementing global climate conventions. And excuse myself, I will repeat some of my previous uh, speakers. United Nations Framework Convention in 1992 was formulated in a way with the intention to build on it with additional COP agreements. The Kyoto Protocol of 1997 focused on greenhouse gases reduction of the industrialized countries till 2012. The Paris Agreement included greenhouse gas reduction of all countries, all parties, to keep the global temperature from increasing more than 1.5 degrees compared with the pre-industrialization era. And the Glasgow Climate Pact focused on phasing out, among others, fossil fuels and increasing the use of renewable energy. Interestingly, there is a growing attention for environmental issues. And as you see, it makes me very happy. This growing attention feeds into growing support for climate actions. Core government responsibility are shifting. For example, let me go back one sheet. For example, in October 8, last year, the Human Rights Council recognized that having a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is indeed a human right. And this also was mentioned already. A lawsuit fell filed by the Urgenda Foundation started the shift in the Netherlands. Greenhouse gas emissions had to be reduced by at least 25% at the end of 2020 compared to 1990. The Supreme Court decided this on December 20 in 2019. Previously, the judge in 2015 and the Court of Appeal in 2018 already decided in favor of the Ugenda Foundation in the case against the Dutch state. One more example. Greta Thunberg. She protested in 2018 in front of the Swedish parliament to get attention for climate change. And thereafter, she was invited to the highest United Nations platform addressing world leaders on the need for direct climate actions. This speech is not to encourage youth protests, nor is it an appeal to summon the government of Aruba to appear before the court, but an argument for recognizing that having a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a human right and it could be a peaceful path into the future implementing climate change, climate actions. 
Neither the Rio Convention in 1992, nor the Paris Agreement in 2015 had substantial energy to move Aruba's way of conducting business into an approach which is more cross-general, inclusive, and in harmony with, with nature. I, I'm saying exactly the same as Ryan is saying, but just a little bit different. At least, these conventions and agreements, they didn't result in a legal binding climate action in Aruba yet. The IPC Global Climate Assessment Report 6 of August 2021 provides science-based information which could be used to take climate actions on local level. In the United Nations Framework Convention, the Paris Agreement, the Glasgow Climate Pact, and the recognition of a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right would be considered and used to initiate our national legislative process. Either our parliament or one of the ministers could initiate this process. Since climate change supersedes individual ministry, it is re recommended to install a multi-ministerial committee or council. I'm smiling again. Our prime minister announced it earlier. This committee should test, be tasked with advising the government of Aruba for the implementation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the relevant COP decisions. This committee could be tasked to draft a strategic plan to become carbon neutral on the long term. As man, uh, Prime Minister mentions, 2050. Furthermore, this committee committee or council should be tasked to build our climate resilience and consider most vulnerable citizens and future generations. A third climate action I took as an example preparing for this speech is involving the next generation also mentioned already. I asked my son and his girlfriend to give feedback on this speech. As I'm already a sparring partner for their future plans. With the preparation of this speech, I involved my kids to make sure that the longevity of climate efforts are maintained. In order to reach for climate proof community, we need a community who takes climate actions aiming for small carbon footprints. I trust that different speakers will give more examples of climate actions with small carbon footprints. Please feel free to take a step yourself and involve youth to leave a carbon, a low carbon footprint and a bright future. I thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Buchhout, for this uh, enlightening presentation. And it's really nice to hear about the um, sequence of international treaties um, that you mentioned and how we are trying to embed that in local policies. Um, I was triggered also by the mention of the Glasgow Climate Pact and the phase out of fossil fuels, actually the phase down of coal as they are heavily debated in, uh, in Glasgow. But um, I hope that uh, these ideas will be incorporated in the new climate policy that you mentioned. 
for the time being. We are having some technical challenges, so I just want to make sure, Deborah, if we are on to uh, the next speaker. Yeah, just yes. Okay, so then I will introduce the next speaker, who is Mrs. Uh, Jocelyn Cruz. Uh, Mrs. Cruz is the chairperson of our lab uh, SD commission, and the Sustainable Development uh, Group uh, Commission of Aruba. And the SD commission is mandated to give strategic direction and to coordinate the implementation of the SDGs. Mrs. Cruz has a broad background in diplomacy and maintains close relations with the UN and New York. Mrs. Cruz, please come forward. I just want to see if you're using your Zoom chances with your eyes at the Good evening. So we've heard a lot about climate change and its impact. Ryan, I think you give a very vivid and visual rendition of what can expect us as a small island. Um, quite a doom scenario, but there are solutions. And the United Nations Single Development Goals are actually an agenda to help us create solutions. I hope most of you are familiar with these goals. They're quite lively and hopeful, aren't they? 17 goals that have been adopted in 2015 by all members of the United Nations, which is quite incredible. It's a voluntary commitment that was made to change the world, to transform the world as we have seen it, to transform development. It entails a new way of thinking that is based on the sustainable de development paradigm that we've seen as well in the Brundtland report. And where we see sustainable development, not only in a linear model, not only as an economic development, but as development that takes into consideration our natural resources, our society, and that we can measure the impact of our development. What a beautiful agenda. So basically, early on, when we, well, the um, SDGs were adopted, the government decided that also for Aruba, we were gonna adopt the sustainable development goals. And why is this? I think that a lot of what has been said today makes it quite obvious. We need coherence. We need transformation if we're gonna change things. We need to be able to measure our impact, the impact in the way we do things. So the 17 development goals are not just 17 goals. No, there are about 169 targets and 263 indicators. And these are global indicators, but it's really with local action that we're gonna make the change. So for us, we know that perhaps traditionally, Long-term planning is not our forte. Stove-pipe thinking is more the way that we have done business traditionally, working in silos. This integrated agenda helps us look behind these silos and integrate policy together and see where there are bottlenecks and impacts of one policy towards the other, how it influences each other. So going now to what we've done for Aruba. In 2017, we received a United Nations mission 
called the MAPS mission because it's a certain approach, management acceleration and policy support mission of the United Nations Development Group. And together with NGOs, university, private sector, we developed as a urban community, a roadmap that functions as a strategy and a guide to implement the SDGs in Aruba. The nine accelerators, as we call it, it's basically where it's seen that we had the biggest impact were needed in terms of our development and where the reach was gonna be bigger were developed by these people. As the SDGs are organized in five areas called the pillars, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships, the community developed where we saw that the biggest impacts would be. And as you can read from here, from the people pillar, we have quality of life and well being, youth empowerment, and for planet, natural resource management, for prosperity, renewable energy and energy efficiency, for prosperity, also sustainable tourism and entrepreneurship and a I think sustainable business environment, if I remember correctly. And then for peace, strengthen institutional quality and capacity, and then strengthen statistical capacity. And then last but not least, Aruba as a model for sustainable development. These accelerators were actually adopted and accepted by the Council of Ministers in August 2018, forming a new path towards where we want to go as an island and accepting that this is the path as well that we see as the future for Aruba. Out of these accelerators, the SDG Commission together with the Department of Economic Affairs decided that we were gonna develop a national strategic plan based on the SDGs. And the National Strategic Plan determined a long-term vision for Aruba for 2030. However, with short-term, three short-term plans. And the first plan was from 2020 to 2022, where actions were development, developed to start implementing the SDGs. Now coming to climate change, and energy efficiency, as we saw interestingly enough, the climate change could fall under planet, if you see it, and energy efficiency under prosperity. And one was this chosen is of course, on the one hand, because we see the integrative approach of the SDGs. More importantly as well, is that it shows that an economic model that exists where we only focus on making money without looking at the impact and the destruction, no longer good. You can make and have economic impact, economic development by investing in sustainable energy. And I keep looking at Mr. Bimans <laughs> because he is a firm believer in this and he has shown He's a trailblazer for Aruba, and he has shown that it is possible. And we just need to clone you, Mr. Bemans. <laughs> we need many more like you who believe in this because it's essential. It's essential. You know, we have heard various speakers say here today that we're not net contributors. Of course not. Our ecological footprint, our climate footprint is negligible as a small island. Yet, as the pictures have shown, we are the ones to lose the most. So it's a choice. 
It's a choice that we have. If we want to make Aruba a model for sustainable development, we have the choice to be part of the solution. We don't need to only see ourselves as the victims. We can help show the rest of the world that what Aruba does can be scalable and can be adopted elsewhere. Why not? Denmark has done it. Denmark was the biggest oil producer of the European Union and chose for a renewable energy path. Not easy. No, not easy. Definitely not. But sometimes choices need to be made. And choices need to be made together. There's no way that the government can do it alone. Absolutely no way. Right, Prime Minister? And we always look at the government to do it. But believe me, it's the Mr. Beemans that have to be cloned. <laughs> the universities are citizens like Mr. Abut's person mentioned <laughs> that indeed it, may, it takes all of us, academia, government, everybody, we're all in this together. Tomorrow where our cars are on the water, our houses are on the water, we will not say, oh, it's the government's fault. No. I remember I had a presentation at the Kavika um, um, once. And of course, you know, the, the business sector asks, what incentives do you have? Yeah, you know, governments can create incentives. That's the role of the government, facilitate business, right? But they don't do business for you. And they said, so what incentives do we have? I said, we have, but you have to take action as well. Because tomorrow, like we have seen in Thailand and the Philippines where a beach closes, now with COVID, it can be the beach is closed because water has entered. Are you as a business person gonna say, I participated in making my island more resilient, resilient to future shocks, economic, environmental, and climatological? No. So what we have done as well, what we have identified in the roadmap, and I didn't completely mention this because they were all mapped, uh, mentioned, we did a rapid integrated assessment. And in that assessment that looked at all policy documents, they said 80% of Aruba's policies were aligned, could be aligned with the SDGs. Imagine 80%. So we know, like Ryan mentioned, it's not new. We have it in us. We have it in us. So if we have it in us, we can make it happen. We could only measure 40% of the indicators, which is not strange. And you know which ones we could measure less? The ones on planet, the environment. So how can we make informed policy decisions, which the SDGs offer us to do by the indicators, right? We're gonna measure the impact. It's a whole way new of thinking. We make long-term planning, we have targets, we have indicators that can help us measure impact because we can monitor and evaluate. And because it's a global agenda, Everybody can use these goals and localize them and make them their own, no matter who you are, right? As a small island, if we all unify, if we all have the, the stakeholders together, imagine the changes we can make. It takes all of us. So that's what I want to say today. I'm a firm believer that this long-term agenda that transcends short-term cycles that transcends the current generation and looks at the impact of the future generation, brings everything together that we have discussed today and provides us with concrete solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Cruz, for this uh, wonderful address on the, um, the role of the, uh, the SDGs within the context of climate change. And um, that concludes the first block 
of uh, speakers, we are we have really highlighted various dimensions of the institutional framework relating to the climate, and it also shows the complexity. Uh, but it also shows that we are making progress in all of these areas. I just summarize in the prime minister who pointed out the policy and policy perspective. Uh, the ombudsman um, who pointed out the human rights um, perspective and uh, sustainability as a fundamental right for citizens. Uh, Mrs. Schwengel who pointed out the uh, European uh, and EU perspectives, which of course are a starting point for our society. And um, Mr. Kuhlhaus, who pointed out the uh, climate treaties, uh, economic policy, and monetary aspect thereof. It shows that we have to tie everything together in order to um, create a solution space and define the society that we are striving for. There's a lot of work to be done in the policy area, in short. That brings us to the second block and considering time, we're gonna continue at once. So we're not gonna break. Um, and we're gonna look at some of the more pragmatic aspects of climate. The first up is Mr. Um, Rino Hermans. Mr. Hermans is the director of the Bureau of Disaster Management in Aruba, Bureau Rampenbestrijding. For many years, Mr. Hermans has been focusing on climate change effects in Aruba, and I believe he is one of the few people who truly understands and who has a true fundamental understanding of these risks for Aruba. Therefore, Mr. Hermans, we are happy to have you. Please come forward. Good evening. Protocol is established. Let me explain um, the disaster management office in Aruba, how we make plans, how we roll out our plans, how we make our action plans. We discuss in Papiamento, we write it in Dutch, we explain it in English, and we execute in Spanish. So <laughs> this is a kind of, of disaster inside uh, our office, but um, the first block was to bring in bigger picture, there is a risk for the humanity, for the global, and for the extents of existence of the humanity. In, in Aruba, we have rolled out the action plan already. If we give honor to one of our minister in memory, um, Daniel Leo, he saw this vision in the 70s and start making dams in Aruba to reserve rainwater. After that, we leave that project of local agriculture to sleep. That brings us to, Ryan did the, the job of explaining the risk, what we will lose. What we did in Aruba is in 2011, make the module of sea level rise, what we will lose and what we need to respond in any case. 24 incident for Aruba. And in that case, um, in 2015, we have made a decision. We're gonna manage all risk on Aruba in a vertical, that is the commander in chief, the prime minister, till the, the last um, first responder in the field, and we will go horizontal. So in 2016, we start knocking on the schools. There is a big capacity of schools, um, capacity of human in, in the schools that normally in the incident will stay home not with the new disaster management office. Everybody have to help Aruba recover in 10 days. So we start certifying all our schools in disaster management crisis team. So they, they can talk the same language, understand the same risk that every first responder on the island um, understand the first responder of crisis management. After that, we went to the hotel sector, commercial sector, and we have certified them too. 
So what we have in Aruba, the government um, government um, responders, the school responders, and the um, commercial responders. So we are building our human capacity, seeing that we don't have enough in Aruba. We have using the community that is St. Martin, what Mr. St. Martin didn't do before Irma. The second part of our um, plan of resilience and redundancy Aruba, we have convert one office in the continuity of operation to avoid Asia of Haiti 2010 earthquake of um, there was no place for government to run the, the country. So right now Aruba have a office that in case of largest Met Boulevard, um, something happened, go on the water or it is a tsunami. We have an area that we can have the governor, we have an office in there. We have um, capacity for the council of minister, the, the parliament, the crisis team, everybody can reunite under one, one roof and continue to govern this um, island. And after that, we went for um, medical and the health um, capacity. We are making our uh, field hospitals for 160 people, not only for Aruba, but we can be deployed. And it is humanity for the Caribbean. So each island in the Caribbean that can needs a medical evacuation. We have the capacity on the island to respond to them. Because normally they say that Caribbean is the backyard of um, America. We say uh, Caribbean is neighbor of America, uh, America because backyard is, we, everybody knows what happens in the backyard. Everybody fed the on their backyard. So we are neighbors. And as a small island, we will show the world, even with the small capacity that we have, we have the capacity to help other islands in their hazardous of in their disaster situation. So um, the first block was telling you we have a risk, we have to do something. I'm telling you, we are rolling out our plan, we don't have to make a plan. 1st of June 2022, we will start a project, um, early warning system Aruba, the most modern in the region, if it is not the most modern in the world, because it's going to be a smart, we're from the cell phone, smartphone, we can talk to the community, it's not only a Syrian, but telling the people what to do in, in the case, and it's a uh, common alert protocol. So every alert in the world will be passed through our early warning system. If I'm lucky, over two weeks, I will get the approval for 400,000 euro to come with a plan for food security for Aruba. So we have passed three screening already. The last screen is taking place in two weeks. We're gonna have 400,000 euro to invest in food security, not the research, but what we have to do in the food security situation on the island. Again, some time for the other speakers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Hermans, for um, your eloquent words and for looking out uh, for us in terms of executing the disaster and risk management function for Aruba. Then, next, we welcome Mr. Ewald uh, Demans, uh, the director of the Bukuti and Tara Resort. Go behind the camera. This resort is carbon neutral. Congratulations. Last year at COP26, Mr. Demons was awarded the prestigious 
Global UN 2020 Climate Action Award for Climate Control Now. Moreover, he was also a co-signatory of the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Change for the Tourism Industry Worldwide. Mr. Biermans, please come forward. Greetings to you. I thank you for inviting me to this very special conference. Uh, it's an honor to be here <clears throat> among such distinguished uh, audience. It is five to 12, so to speak, and we need to work hard to save the bit of nature that we have left on our one happy island. And by doing so, we mitigate global damage to our planet. I was asked to speak about the work at Bukuti and Tara Beach Resort. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the history. Our journey started in 1993 after reading about the first COP conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. At that time, we put a green team together and had achieved major milestones over the years. You may recall our cleanup actions called the Sponsor for Mile program um, along the beaches of Aruba in, 1990, in 1996. We certified Green Globe in 1997 and we certified LEED in 2010. We certified Carbon Neutral in 2018 and for all this work, we were awarded several awards. One of them by the United Nations, one by the WTO and the other one by the WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council. Most recently during the United Nations COP conference, uh, uh, World Conference, a little resort in Aruba was the one hotel worldwide present to sign the Glasgow Declaration, a commitment to a decade of tourism climate action, representing the hotel industry worldwide. And thank you to Minister Weber, who was uh, present uh, during the conference and for his moral support. One of the reasons we, are, we were selected is because of our sustainability program and in its entirety is fully du duplicable and total, totally scalable. So it is easily imitated by anyone in the industry. We reduced the total waste disposal in our hotel by 68% by var various means that we introduced. We reduced food waste by 30%. We reduced energy consumption by 35% over the, over the last 20 years. We, are, we used about 40% renewable energy at this moment. We recycle about half of our gray water. And we, we are almost 100% paperless and we eliminated one-time use plastic 20 years ago. We just recently <laughs> talked about... <laughs> we talked about uh, paper straws. They're only about four or five years old. We, we reduced one-time use plastic 20 years ago. Uh, and the list goes on in about 200 uh, or more best practices throughout the, throughout the hotel. Anyone interested should contact us and we will gladly offer the tour and the information. And it's all available on the website, including videos and uh, guest information. Uh, we, are, we are no geniuses. Anyone can do the most, can do most of this at home as well. There's also a commercial end to this. It is not 100% altruistic what we're doing. We don't do this only for the, for the environment. We also do it for business. We look at it as niche marketing to attract customers who think like we do. A customer that wishes to enjoy an environmentally safe and guilt-free vacation, a carbon-free vacation, during the stay with us. Since achieving carbon neutrality in 2018, our goal is to become net zero and possibly carbon negative. At this moment, we offset about 5% of our carbon emissions through, the, through an offset program with the wind farm in Father Pete and the wind farm in India as prescribed by the auditing and certifying body. We aim to become carbon negative. As a, resort, as a resort, we offer zero emission vacations and our sustainability concierge facilitates offset purchases for our customers for the airlines at this moment. 
Our goal is to offer a 100% guilt-free, carbon emissions-free vacation from your home or from anybody's home and return to your home, your home door, including transportation and air and an entire vacation and return you to your home with zero CO2 emissions. You don't think that's possible? Well, we will do it. Uh, we are intent to eliminate flight shaming. I don't know if that's a concept for you. But flight shaming, uh, Mrs. Greta Bamberg from, from Sweden talks about it. You should not fly. We will shame that because flying will be part of a carbon-free vacation. So, but why did we do all this? Um, we didn't do this to cut back on greenhouses only or CO2 or methane emissions. It is simple. We saw a disaster in the making coming at us. We have followed the COP conferences in Rio in 1992, Kyoto, Stockholm, Paris, and more recently in Glasgow. We realized early on that we are heading towards a trouble uh, and uh, with global heating and glaciers melting and weather related calamities creating havoc worldwide. And you saw some of the the examples here today. We need to clean up our act globally, but to do so, we need to clean up our own house first. As, we, as the saying goes, charity starts at home. We need to start here in Aruba. We all will have work to do. We all have to work overtime and the clock is ticking. It is five to 12 and that 1.5 degrees Celsius limitation is almost reached. Beyond that, we face disaster. We will not be able to save our planet as we are just a tiny part of a vast worldwide problem, but we can work towards preserving some of what we, uh, what we will pass on to our next generation of Arubans. For years, I've been saying that Aruba is not in the tourism business. We are in the nature business. And this is something I missed here today a little bit, the part of nature. Uh, we are in... Without our incredible nature, or beaches, or reefs, or excellent climate, we will not have any tourists visiting us. Therefore, we must work hard to protect our nature, because there will be no tourism without our nature. And we are destroying our nature day by day in Aruba at this moment. Please be aware. We will... Thank you. What will future generations of Arubans do? What will they live from? Nature is our one and only asset, our one natural or only natural resource. Other countries have industries. They have numerable natural resources. We still have some nature left. Let us preserve it. As a Caribbean nation, we are, we are incredibly vulnerable. Our oceans are rising, our beaches will flood. Our wonderful Eagle Beach and Palm Beach will be flooded and our great grandchildren might go snorkeling there and see what was once 12 kilometers of worldwide famous sugar white beach of Palm Beach and Eagle Beach. They will look at it through snorkels. Our Caribbean beaches will disappear. The rising oceans will flood them. Our visitors will step out of their rooms and wade into the ocean. Most of the hotels are too close to the water. Most of the eastern seaboard of the United States and many other parts of the world will be flooded. Populations will shift and global heating will bring changes everywhere. Disastrous changes, that is. We can do our part in reducing our footprint and hopefully preserve some of the nature we have left and, thus our part, and, and do our part locally and globally. We applaud the plans of our government to free the island of fossil fuels by the by the year 2030 and for signing up to become carbon neutral by the year 2050. But there's a great need for cooperation and alignment with government policy. Only together we can make things work. But to become fossil free is just part of the groundwork we need to, to lay. We need to address some urgent matters here in Aruba. And while we clean our own house, we can start working on helping our planet to survive by preserving and repairing the damage already done. Or nature, or dying reefs, and the ocean needs to be protected from destruction. From destruction by vehicles, by boats, by excessive buildings, by indiscriminate cleaning, clearing of the land. 
uh, read Karmavi report and you, you can uh, read a little bit about what the issues are. Our coastal and marine environments environmental plan will need to be implemented. The marine park will need to be, become a, a guardian of the area. And for more information on, on, on ocean and, and marine environment, I would refer you to Mr. Moon, who is an expert in that area. The Rointelike and Twicklings plan, called the ROPV, needs to be implemented and enforced in its entirety. A set of environmental laws need to be legislated and enforced. Reducing our island-wide waste by reducing and reusing and recycling and proper disposal of waste needs to be achieved. And a temporary moratorium on new construction should be implemented and serious thought should be given to future expansions. And a 10-year master plan should be introduced and I heard here tonight that there is something in the working. Construction standards like LEED or, the, or, the, or, or similar uh, European uh, standards should be introduced and established and enforced so that buildings are built properly and uh, in this way uh, uh, reduce energy consumption by 15, 20% and CO2 emissions as well. And that is one thing uh, close to my heart, our animal world needs protection and our pets need urgent protection. Implementing implementation of the laws, the lay the cacho needs to be enforced. Stimami, Sami can tell you more about the, the, that issue and the needs. Reducing our dependence uh, on fossil fuels uh, by uh, solar and uh, electric vehicles. We should reduce our imports of non-essentials and the exports uh, and the export of dollars, saving of massive amounts of fuel, eliminating leaching of to toxic waste into the ocean, reducing methane emissions, and so forth and so forth. The list is about 20, 25 points long. And I'm not gonna go and bore you with them, but um, I'm willing to um, assist and help. As a small island, we will not be able to save our planet, but we can save what we have left so future generations can enjoy and make a living. And by saying that, we have to contribute to mitigate or by, or by saving what we have, we can contribute to mitigate the damage we already done globally. Hopefully we achieve that collectively and we, and we can contain global temperatures rising from below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is critical. I must thank my green team that worked for me all these years, our management team who made uh, our achievements possible. They worked hard and will continue to work hard to further uh, our sustainability program. And I thank you for listening to my presentation. It lays within your power to bring the change our island begs for. You can count on our commitment as a resort and the citizens of Aruba. Thank you, Masha Danke. Next, we have Mr. Diego Acevedo, who uh, is a PhD candidate from the University of Aruba and from the system program. Mr. Acevedo holds a Master of Science from Delta University of Technology and is an expert in the area of renewable energy and climate sustainability issues. Moreover, he has a passion for small islands. Mr. Acevedo, please come forward. Hi, good evening, everybody. Protocols observed, of course. Um, I see there's a small glitch with the PowerPoint, so maybe you won't see some of the images as I can, uh, I can see. But in the end, it's all about perspective, I think. Uh, my title today, Sustainability on Small Islands, but actually I think about it as uh, big ocean states, not small island states, like a lot of people have said. There's quite a number of... Uh, other fellow island states that think of themselves uh, as such. We have uh, unfortunately neglected to look at the ocean. Most of us have our back um, to it. Yeah, the, yeah. okay. So as I'm part of the system program of the University of Aruba, I also, uh, I'm a, an engineer, I'm an entrepreneur. I uh, work on ocean related um, solutions, uh, engineering solutions for food, for energy, for water, um, 
and for uh, materials. So I hope to come with a little bit of a different perspective again today on, on the challenge that we're facing. So I will start with a little bit of doom. Uh, unfortunately, there was a couple of studies published uh, very recently that told us what was the actual overall reduction in greenhouse gas emissions due to the COVID pandemic. And it is a very sad number to hear when we know that all of the, that this flight shaming, all of these flights that were uh, grounded during almost a full year, everybody's at home, all the offices are closed, but the amount of greenhouse reductions that we were able to achieve by just staying home was less than 8%. So basically we stayed home and it didn't really do much globally. This is a problem. And it's a bigger problem than we think because yes, we're here in Aruba, a nice tropical island next to the ocean, but this is a map of the global density of the world. We know where emissions are coming from. We know that most of the world's population is located in the tropics. Most of the world's population is located next to the ocean. But somehow most of global emissions are not coming from those tropical coastal areas. They're coming from the developed world. And we want everybody to be able to reach a sustainable development, reach the standard of living that actually us here in Aruba are reaching. So that's where I see the opportunity for this big state, this big ocean state of Aruba and our partners within the kingdom. We see that interrelation. We see these issues globally, food, energy, water. Everybody's talking about this. Uh, most of Europe is thinking we're going to run out of energy. We're running a run out of food. We're going to run out of water. Yeah, Aruba knows this for decades already. All of our energy has been imported. Most of our food has come from outside. All of our water for the past hundred years has been coming from the ocean. We've actually developed those technologies to be able to have a thriving society. And that's something that we don't realize. Desalination technology in Aruba is over 100 years old, 1903, if I'm not mistaken. So from there, we've expanded and sent this type of technology all over the world. Desalination technology within the last 10 years is exploding, exponential growth in that industry. But here, as Arubans, we could have taken a big step to provide that type of technology to the world. Unfortunately, that was not the case. But it's not just food, energy, and water, because to solve these challenges, they're all related to climate, as we've heard earlier. It is also materials. It is also where are we getting all the materials that we need to be able to move to this uh, energy transition. So the European Union has commissioned a few studies, this is from 2020, actually on, on critical raw materials for the EU and for that energy transition that we need. There's a number of materials that we need, Thankfully, we have the ocean for a lot of these, actually. So if we look at the ocean, all the rivers go through that, they end up in the ocean. We have all these materials there. So we have abundance of raw materials. The problem is we don't know how to get them. And so actually that's what I'm doing at the, at the University of Aruba together with Kari Leuven and, uh, and, uh, and the process team, uh, where we're looking into moving from this linear type of economy towards a circular economy. Um, I myself am focusing currently on how do we get value out of that waste that we're dumping back into the ocean from the water desalination process. So right now we bring in very large amounts of water up to our shorelines. We push them through these filters, quite energy efficient, if I may say. Water production is less than 6% of our energy consumption in Aruba and all of our water is coming from that plant. Um, and then we put all this energy, time, effort, people into, into this water and then we throw away a concentrate that has almost every element in the periodic table. So hopefully we can uh, come up with some interesting solutions from here that then we can scale up to all the other desalination plants that I'm talking about right now in the rest of the world. So that's where I see the role that a country like Aruba, a country like Curacao, a place like Bonaire can have in this whole um, global system. This is where we really have a role to play. It's not just only about our carbon footprint, only about our use of materials, but also how can we teach the rest to do this? And we've done this before. I mentioned desalination. 
I'm also showing these pictures, but I see something different. Perspective on these pictures is very important. I heard that just earlier. On the picture on the left, I see Denmark, a country about the third of the size of the Netherlands, who one day decided to make a bet that wind energy was going to be a viable source of energy. It was the expensive bet. They have a lot of oil. It was for sure the expensive bet. But now these windmills were made in Denmark. Any big wind park in the world has heavy Danish influence. Their industry benefits immensely by building these things. Picture on the right, again, I see one step that we took in Aruba for our own uh, greenhouse carbon footprint, lower this, but I see Germany. Yes, all those solar panels are most of them being made in China, but Germany is the country that benefits the most from the solar industry. Why? Because they took a bet. And they said, we think this is something we should do. They're not a sunny country, but they still took the bet of saying, oh, solar park, this could be something for the future. We need to move in that direction. And now whenever you have a large solar uh, installation, heavy German influence, technologies from there, the engineers that design them are from there. Sure, they're made in China. Cheaper energy, unfortunately, uh, with other sources. So this is where I see those possibilities is something that we can do. And those technologies exist. So different technologies to be able to complement the steps that we have taken. And again, I'm gonna say the Caribbean and the kingdom of the Netherlands, Curacao being one of the pioneers in wind energy over 30 years ago already having wind parks. So this is, is something that we can show the world but also benefit in the, in the meantime. This is something that's very close to my heart. I've worked with, with this type of technology for over 12 years, trying to develop this large scale climate solutions that can help us. So this is ocean thermal energy. This is something that from Aruba we can develop that is being developed elsewhere. When I started looking to that, I started looking into it initially just energy, but then you start branching out. What have other people done in Japan, in Taiwan, in Korea? In Hawaii, they said, well, we use this ocean thermal energy, but then they also feed themselves. They have greenhouses that are cooled, making produce that wouldn't grow there otherwise. They have algae farms that are NASDAQ listed companies doing all these nutritional supplements. So they're supplementing their economies by using a resource that nobody else has. Us, we're an ocean state, we have that resource. So I think that's something that we could do uh, here in Aruba. Uh, it's been talked about before. This is a picture from only a couple of months ago um, in French Polynesia, country far, far, far away from everything, where they are moving ahead with these type of technologies because it just makes sense. Lower carbon, lower cost, sustainable use of the ocean. Something that we really need to uh, look. Um, this is something that this could look like in Aruba, a nice big district cooling system wiping out about 20% of our energy demand in one go. That's 20% of oil that we wouldn't have to import or LNG or any other type of fossil based fuel because that's something that's, as was mentioned earlier, always running. This is another opportunity that I see floating solars where we don't have enough space. I've actually ran the numbers. Uh, we would need more than 500 megawatts. That's about a half a gigawatt of solar park if we were to run full Aruba on solar. We don't have the space. We are one of the high, highest density uh, populations in the world. So we need to look at where do we have the space and not just look at where do we put something and that's it. How do we put it in a good way? Something that's gonna give us extra value, something that's going to perhaps you know, in synergies with wind parks, we can generate a lot more power in a very small place. Uh, that way we don't have to use all of our ocean, which we need to take care of. Uh, we can think of fish shelter, we can think of help farms, anything else. Entrepreneurs are there and innovators are there ready to do things if they're allowed to. Uh, we can think of coral restorations, living breakwaters. I hear, for instance, in front of your uh, hotel, Mr. Beemans, the need for a breakwater, how there's all this erosion going on on the coast because we've neglected some of the coral ecosystems that were there. We could come up with innovative solutions to make this um, replenish. Not only that, I see other opportunities on climate controlled uh, and protected agriculture. When I hear the talks on Aruba on food, 
a lot of this goes into the cost of water. But I also see that in Aruba, we have about five or six high tech um, growers now. When you go talk to them, that's not their issue anymore. It's not the cost of water, it's the cost of energy. How do they maintain climate control? How do they get the right crops that will grow here, be it with salt water uh, tolerant crops or with innovative technologies that come out? This is an example from a farm in Saudi Arabia, for instance, where the King Abdullah University, Science, uh, University of Science and Technology has been pushing uh, very hard on trying to grow things in a place that can't grow anything under normal circumstances. Reminds me of Aruba when I look at, can we grow tomatoes here? Can we grow cucumbers? Can we grow other things that we're otherwise importing, of course? So I think that's, that's important to see. So as I mentioned, the solutions are abundant. It requires a different perspective. It needs a cultural and a political mind shift of who are we doing this for? How can we do this? Is it just for us? Is it also for the rest of the world? What type of uh, innovation niches can we create? How, which legislation needs to be updated to make sure that those innovation niches actually flourish? Uh, how can we enable those risk takers? How do we provide that structural and financial support and get the right partnerships in place? Because it, of course, the risk comes with a reward. Who's putting the, the, the risk in there? Who else is going to benefit? So we need those international partnerships to be able to fund this. We cannot take the risk alone as a, as a smaller economy in the end, but we can, we can help others um, develop this. Uh, system, which I'm proudly uh, a part of, is one of those examples where I think uh, where we have a long-term vision and we help foster that human element and try to reverse the brain drain that is usually occurring on, on our islands. So with that, um, I leave you with uh, the islands. We have done this before. Picture person on the right is a personal hero of mine. May he rest in peace, unfortunately. Mr. Tony de Brum, he was the architect of the climate agreement in Paris. He was a minister from the Republic of Martian Islands, small little island, single-handedly got most of the world to actually agree to 1.5 degrees um, cap on, on climate change. Just one person from a small island could have that global influ influence. We can do this again and again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Acevedo, for this commendable presentation. And we know you are a big advocate of sustainability. You've even been in Paris, I believe, in 2015, close to the signing of the original agreement. So next we have um, Mrs. Uh, Amor van Vegel, a PhD candidate from the system program at the University of Aruba. She holds a Master of Science in Food Technology from Wageningen University in Research. She's an expert in food and sustainability, with a, and within this field, she focuses on calculating the environmental impact of food chains. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mrs. Van Vegel, please go ahead. I hope that the technology Trying. is up and running. And we have been doing relatively well on signing, although we may shorten the program towards the end in order really to um, terminate on time, okay? Okay, thank you a lot for a very nice introduction. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, audience at home. So today I'm going to talk about the carbon footprint of our food consumption. Everything actually has a carbon footprint. The chair you're sitting on, the clothes you're wearing, the laptop you're looking at. And I'm going to dive into why does food have a carbon footprint and why should we care? Well, first of all, the food system is responsible for one third of global greenhouse gas emissions, but also for 80% of global deforestation, for 70% of fresh water use, 
of biodiversity loss on land and 50% of freshwater biodiversity loss. But next to that, we need land to grow food, but about 52% of global land is degraded. On top of that, world population is increasing and getting more wealthy. When we get more wealthy, we tend to eat more meat. And this is gonna worsen all the problems described earlier. So today I'm gonna to talk about my research at the University of Aruba with its system, which is about the environmental impact of the food consumption of ibex with an in-depth case study of Aruba. Then I will give a few action points. What can we do tomorrow? And what, it, what do I think is one of our biggest challenges to achieve a sustainable food system here on Aruba, which can be an example to the rest of the world, as we have heard earlier today, is possible. So my research, I'm doing three different things at the moment, but more is to follow because I still have two and a half years left. First of all, I'm calculating the environmental impact of Aruba's food consumption. In this presentation, I will only focus on carbon footprint. So we had a look with the help of students. I have a lot of help of students, thank God. Uh, a lot of students from KU Leuven, students from this university as well. We looked at the carbon footprint of Aruba's food imports because later on we will add to the local food production. And we will also do this study probably for Curacao later on this year. There are a lot of results, but one of the main things that I think everyone here should know is that although beef contributed only for three weight percent to the total food imports, it contributed for 26% to the total carbon footprint of Aruba's food consumption. Now, why does beef have a carbon footprint? Well, the cow stands somewhere in Brazil, the US, the Netherlands maybe. Maybe forest was burned for that. The cow is at the farm. It's eating, digesting, emitting methane emissions, a potent greenhouse gas. The cow is excreting manure, greenhouse gases. The cow is eating that feed, the food for the cow had to come from somewhere. Maybe land was deforested, fertilizers were needed, pesticides, herbicides, a tractor driving over the land powered by diesel. Feed had to be processed. And on top of that, the slaughterhouse, transport, retail, and packaging. But what I want you to take away from this is that the largest part of the carbon footprint of beef is not due to packaging or transport, but due to what happens at the farm. So this is an example of an example. This is a research showing the general carbon footprint of different food products. What I want you to take away from this one is that in general, animal products have the highest carbon footprint with an exception for milk, which is a very watery product. Now you see here, beef has a carbon footprint of 60 kilograms per kilogram, but that's not true because beef can have a variable, beef has every food product, has a variable carbon footprint and it can be anywhere for beef between 10 and 432 kilograms per kilo, kilogram CO2 per kilogram. The higher end of the scale is when deforestation occurred in the production of beef. So that's why the second part of my research is to find out more about the specific carbon footprint of beef in Aruba. We do this also for chicken and the selection of fish and seafood products. Once we know what country the beef comes from, it brings us a lot closer to what is the real environmental impact, the real carbon footprint. And we see that beef from the Netherlands in general scores a lot lower than beef from Brazil. This is depending on production methods. The last part of the study I want to talk about is I'm looking into the carbon footprint of different vegetables. And I wanna to take tomatoes as an example. So we can buy tomatoes from maybe eight different countries of origin with each different production methods and different ways 
the tomatoes can get to Aruba. What I want to share about this research, this preliminary research, is that what matters most is not how far away is this country. It's how does the tomato get to Aruba by sea or by air? And on average, <laughs> the air thing, again, flying shape. On average, when we import that tomato by air, it's emitting eight times more greenhouse gases than by sea. So we need to ask ourselves, is this necessary? And that's an interesting question because food touches upon so many different topics, economics, um, policy, preferences, etc. So what, I know. <laughs> um, and that's why I'm looking for partnerships for my research. I have already talked with several wholesalers, hotels, but I really want to, to work together with our Aruba community to get solutions tailored to Aruba. So what can we do tomorrow? or tonight if we're still going to the supermarket. First of all, more plants, less animals. More plants, less animals. Reduce food waste. Buy more locally. Prevent flying in of food. And that's not so easy because it's still a bit mysterious when is food flown in or not for the regular consumer. But lastly, I want to emphasize, I'm not asking everyone to become a vegetarian or to become vegan. Food is something highly personal, very intimate, and changing food habits is something that's not so easy. But it can be little changes that we can do. When we're gonna buy a pasticci tomorrow, what are we gonna choose? Beef or chicken? Well, if you don't really care, if you like both, go for chicken. Why? Because you are, you are reducing at least half of the carbon footprint of that action. Of course, I would rather encourage you to buy a fruit shake, but maybe you really feel like a pasticci. I do that too sometimes. So what can we do in the long run? It's not easy. It's not gonna be easy. We need to change our dietary habits. We need a drastic dietary shift as explained before, but asking that from our community right now, it's like asking a kid in a candy store not to eat any candy because we are constantly being seduced. We're being seduced to eat sugary foods, to eat fatty foods, to eat meaty foods, to eat salty foods everywhere, mm -hmm. cannot escape fast food chains everywhere. I live in Santa Cruz. Of course, there's traffic when children need to go to schools or when we, the schools end, but there is traffic around dinner time because there is a huge amount of fast food chains in Santa Cruz and they're building a Burger King as well. So we are seduced by unhealthy food and unsustainable food and that needs to change. It will lead to healthier diets. It will lead to healthier people social benefits and less healthcare costs. I want to end this talk with a very big compliment to everyone on Aruba, on Curissa, on every island, everywhere in the world who is working towards this. Hotels that are reducing their portions, reducing food waste. Providers of vegan foods. People cooking for their family. And thank you to the catering of today that there is no beef on the menu. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tamber Aveto, for these nice words. And uh, we're even applying in practice the uh, food guidelines that you gave. I would like to call forward the next uh, two speakers. They will be the last speakers of um, this evening, last but not least, being uh, Mr. Andrew Brouwer and Ms. Alexandra Ulasio, students at the University of Aruba and the leaders of the Magic Sustainability Initiative at the University of Aruba. So please. Uh,
Buenas noches, everyone. We're very happy to be here and to be able to present to you. Today, we're going to talk about the youth perspective on climate change and its consequences on Aruba. So just to start, I'm going to give a small introduction to who we are. My name is Alexandra Ulasio. I'm a, I'm a second year student here at the University in System. And together with me, I have Andrew Bauer, who's a first year student. And together, we're also part of MAGIC which is an environmental club here at the university. So climate change poses a big threat to our world. Sorry. All right, climate change poses a big threat to our world. Out of the different areas of climate change, um, sea level rise and global warming pose the biggest threats to our societies. It may be possibly the reason for our major um, population extinction. In the sixth report of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it was observed that the climate temperatures have been consequently increasing for the past four years. And it is expected to be roughly half the degree Celsius at the end of the century, even at the best sustainable conditions that we can generate. Additionally, the sea level rise, uh, the sea level will also keep on rising. The report mentioned that by the year 2000, the sea level will be risen by from 0.28 meters to 0.55 meters. Such consequences of climate change are worrying for many islands, island nations, including Aruba, of course. By taking into consideration the sea level rise predictions, uh, along with the rising sea temperatures, it is predicted that by the end of this century, many of our coastal areas around Aruba um, will suffer extensive damage. Many people around the world depend on ocean life for their living. The heating of um, our oceans due to global warming causes a decrease in ocean life, for example, fish, which is very detrimental to the livelihoods of many people around the world. In the case of Aruba, we depend on par um, parrotfish for the, uh, for the replenishment of our beachy sands, our white beach sands. Um, however, due to global warming, um, this species might even become extinct, which would cause a big problem for our white sands, which would also cause a big problem to our economy because tourists um, come to our islands for our beaches. Um, thus, would, it would reduce our tourism. Um, so we should not wait for our beaches to become damaged. We should act now and prevent the issue while we can. Past generations did not worry as much to face um, as much about um, climate action and they did not have to face as much anxiety as current generations do. Um, this is due mainly to the lack of visibility and the lack of the research and uh, mainly to the lack of the acknowledgement of climate, um, climate change in the past. However, this is not the case for current generations. I'm going to pass the word now to Andrew that will talk more about this. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, the youth plays an interesting role in the issue of climate change. We are seen by many as the leaders of tomorrow and are expected to be the pillars of fight against climate change whilst we had little to do with the cause. Regardless, we acknowledge that climate change poses a great threat to our, to our future. This being said, we would expect everyone to make an immediate change to prevent escalation of the issue. 
to stop the unstoppable and put it in reverse. Yet, that is not the case. We are thankful that the government of Aruba has acknowledged the issue of climate change in their agenda and has put it as a high priority in their agenda. Worldwide, big corporations and governments have yet to make any necessary changes to go against the consequences of climate change. Furthermore, some even have to acknowledge the existence of climate change. Because of this, groups of young people have marched to the streets in order to express their concerns and hopefully influence their policymakers. Young people are at an advantage when it comes to implementing and adapting new ideas to help fight climate change. We have the ability to swiftly change the lifestyle choices of everyday life. Thankfully, examples of youth empowerment to fight against climate change can be seen worldwide through various youth organizations. Such is the case in our community. The Environmental Club uh, at the University of Aruba that I am re representing today called MAGIC, short for um, Making Aruba a Greener Environment Club, focuses on education on sustainable topics and executing projects around sustainability. Along with MAGIC, many other organizations also share the same goal, protect and make aware. Scubble Bubbles, an organization that consists mainly of young volunteers, has been credited with being an outstanding innovator by Futura Aruba and the government of Aruba. This organization prides itself in doing underwater cleanups, coral reef restorations, and so much more. These are just a few organizations out of many that are taking action to help Aruba. The University of Aruba is also proudly home to its newest faculty, SYSTEM, which stands for Sustainable Island Solutions through Engineering, sorry, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This study focuses on developing an interdisciplinary view on creating sustainable solutions for small island nations. System is a key factor for higher education in sustainable development. Through system, empowered young adults can not only spread awareness about climate change, but actively contribute to sustainable solu sol solutions as future engineers and scientists. I would like to end our presentation with a quote. It is imperative that the youth also partake in the decision-making of national and glo global le levels. Many proclaim that the youth are leaders of tomorrow. However, taking adequate action starts with the leaders today. Thank you very much. I feel very grateful that we at the university have had the chance to organize this wonderful symposium. Thank you to all of you for making this happen on such a short notice. It was really yeah, eye-opening and fascinating to listen. What I learned, Aruba is about nature. Our earth is about oceans and we should eat more plants, less animals. And it was a good choice when we have a lot of international yeah, visitors on Thursday to choose for chicken and a vegetarian meal. So, and I also learned together, we can make it happen. Let us work together in green teams, in climate change councils. Let us ask for help and assistance invest in partnerships and today we can be sure we have seen it we have a lot of expertise on the island let us make it happen in working together and we should really monitor and measure the impact and everything we are doing now has a strong impact on the future generation 
we need youth empowerment, involvement of the young people. And yeah, as rector, I'm very, very proud of our PhDs, their research, and our students actively involved in actions to hinder climate change. So thank you very much to especially our students and PhD students. Energy transition is also, as we heard today, an old subject. This transition is ongoing from coal to gas to solar energy to renewable energy. So it's an ongoing discussion and we are part of it. We need to adapt our legislation, not only in the energy area. So there's a lot of work to do on Aruba. And we all need a mind shift. And I think that we started today this mind shift. Cross-sectoral action plans are needed. And we also learned we, every single person, and we as Aruba can make a difference and be a model to the world. Thanks again for coming. Thanks again for listening.